to see you again. I actually recognize some of you. This is, I think, my fourth time that uh, I've been out for the Seattle Town Hall in the last uh, 10 years. And so I, I just, um, I, I got to thank the folks at the Seattle Town Hall, the Summit, for hosting this tonight. Um, you all for coming. I love being in Seattle. You're just, you're just so on it. Um, and I was very excited to come here. I've been doing this for a week now, this book tour thing. Um, I think it's like my sixth city in seven days. So <laughs> but here I feel at home. <laughs> um, so thank you. Uh, that, that video actually, I, um, just, just to give you some, some context, it, uh, I was, I was um, listening to music one night um, in Ojai, California, a small sort of town outside of Los Angeles. Um, and, and this band came on and they were just playing all these like just really well lyric songs and you don't have a lot of great lyrics or meaning in a lot of the songs that are around today that get so popularized and it just sort of spoke to me because here I am sort of taking breaks from being around the world um, dealing with you know, talking to central bankers, talking to bankers, talking to people at the IMF and so forth and also getting the scoop on the ground as to how people are affected by all of the, uh, all the things that have happened which I'll talk about in the last uh, 10 years since the financial crisis and, 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 and that song the words are just of like, well, this is what's going on. It's going on and on and on and on and on, no end in sight. And I was like, that's kind of what all of the economic words <laughs> that are used by the people in the financial system, and I use them too on a sort of too regular basis, um, are really saying, that, that there's something going on and on, and it isn't it, it, it's not discussed that much. And, and so what I wanted to do in this book is discuss it. And the book came out of um, a talk I actually gave, or at least it seeded in my mind, um, because of a talk that I actually gave at the Federal Reserve. Um, so it's the summer of 2015. I've written, um, as some of you may know, I've read some of my other works, some disparaging things about the financial system and the Fed and private banking and Wall Street and so forth. And I get an email from the regulatory department at the Federal Reserve. Um, now, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be the regulator of all of the banks, but yes, they also have a department that does this specifically. Um, and they say, do you want to come and talk? We're, um, they have these annual conferences for three days that are just the internal people from the Federal Reserve, uh, the IMF, and the World Bank. So they're not sort of public media things. They're not really handshaky photo op things. They're, they're sort of internal. They take place at the Fed, and supposedly they uh, address the topics that are of concern at that time. So the topic of concern at that time, or at least the one for my segment of the three days, was why isn't Wall Street helping Main Street? And so I, after I asked them if they really meant to have me there, as opposed to someone who um, actually supported uh, Wall Street. Um, they said, yes, we want you there. We want to hear your opinion. So I uh, go to Washington, and I speak after Janet Yellen, who is the former chair of the Federal Reserve, spoke and addressed everyone. And this is all internal. It's all central bankers from around the world. Um, and she speaks to the room full of them and says, we're in a position now where things are, are fine, the banking system is healthy, everything's all good, all these policies have worked. And I'm looking around the room, I'm sitting kind of at the side, and you know, she's in the front, I'm waiting to talk, and there's this feeling of we don't quite feel we're on the same page as you, Janet Yellen, um, from, from some of the central bankers in the room. Um, and they tended to be the central bankers, as I found out, from the smaller central banks around the world that aren't sort of controlling um, or influencing or depositing into the financial system lots and lots of money. They're sort of on the sidelines having to sort of deal with the ramifications. Um, but anyway, she says everything's fine. Then a couple people get up from the Treasury Department um, and they, they're even more enthusiastic about how, how, how great all of the last eight years have been. There's been more regulations, everything's fine, banks are good, economy's healthy. Um, we've got this. And then this cardinal talks. Um, he had just been at the Vatican and he comes and he doesn't talk about monetary policy or finance or anything like that. He just looks at the room full of bankers, kind of addresses the more senior ones, and he says, do you remember the thing about helping the poor? <laughs> and again, sort of uncomfortability in the room. And I stand up and I say, look, uh, the question you have for me um, for this conversation right now today is why isn't Wall Street helping Main Street? So I just say, look, it's really simple. You never made them. You never required anything from these banks that you have subsidized for, at that time, eight years at all. You never said, well, if we give you trillions of dollars of fabricated money, that you have to 
forgive some student debt, or you have to restructure some more mortgages, or you have to give an additional amount of small business loans, or you have to set aside a bunch for infrastructure or development. We, we, we never told you to do any of that. Um, so I said, so what, what, well, what did you expect? Um, but the narrative then and now is that what the central banks have done, in particular the Federal Reserve, is that it's helped the economy. The economy is all fine. Um, and, and I think we know that it's not really all fine. It's fine for the people who got the money. So let me step back, you know, as, as it is. So let me step back. Um, so what's a central bank? What's, what's, what's the real point? And there are many of a central bank. Um, in honor of Yanis's book coming out, a central bank is kind of like a parent who has money or can find money when a sort of bad child <laughs> or sort of child that's running amok, um, you know, drinking too much, doing drugs, ruining the car, etc., keeps coming back and asking for money to go out and do the next thing. Um, and the parent keeps on saying, yeah, okay, fine. So you need money for this. You know, you shouldn't really do drugs. Yeah, okay, I won't. Can I have money for something? No, here's some more money. You really shouldn't drink. You shouldn't drink and drive. You shouldn't do any of the things you're doing, but you know what? We're going to keep on providing you the money to do that. And, and that's how the central bank has behaved, because what the Fed has done over the last 10 years, and particularly in the wake of the financial crisis, is to provide a blank check effectively, an unlimited sum of money, in an unregulated manner by people that are unelected, um, sort of four and a half trillion dollars, just the Fed, that's a very big number, um, which is still on offer right now, to have the banks become healthy again, to enable them to have money again to continue doing what they were doing before the financial crisis, to use that money to buy their own stock, to use that money uh, to enhance their own CEOs and chair people, and not to use the money to do any, things that, any of the things that were at the crux of that question that day uh, to help Main Street. Now, it's not their job, but it is the Fed's job, theoretically, to regulate the banking system. And so when the banking system goes off the rails, um, you know, when, 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 a, when a kid is going off the rails, and it's the job of a good parent to turn in and say, look, that's not okay. Um, things need to change. You can't continue to be like that. But that's not what the Federal Reserve did. Instead, they came in and they said, don't worry, we've got this. Now, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, and it was the result of a panic, and I talked about this in my last book, so I won't go too far on on this, um, that happened in New York in 1913, where a bunch of um, in 1907, where a bunch of speculators rigged the copper market, and they got caught out. They made some bad bets. They were starting to lose money, but they were attached to banks that had real people's deposits in them, and those real people got very concerned that the top of their banks were losing money. And they started walking into the lobbies of those banks, and they started standing outside in the pavement, and they started walking on the sidewalks, and they started getting beaten up by cops at the time, and there was like mass chaos in New York because these banks had bet wrong. They had people's money, and people wanted their money out. And it looked bad. It was cosmetically bad. And J.P. Morgan, who was the head banker at the time in the world and in New York, was concerned because to an extent, all the people were involved in all of the banks. The, the, the more sort of powerful people at the larger banks, but it just didn't look good cosmetically for anyone else. So he goes to Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president at the time. He says, look, I can fix this. I need some money from the Treasury Department. So the first bailout of the banking system happened in 1907. It was $25 million. It was the Treasury Department giving the money to J.P. Morgan and saying, look, you just figure it out. Just, just fix it. Help the banks. You don't help the banks. Whatever you do, just fix it. Make it go away. And he took the $25 million. He gave it to his friends. He let other banks fail. Um, and at the end of that, he was still concerned going forward that you know, perhaps if there is another panic like this for whatever reason, it was kind of stressful to have to figure out what to do. And what if the Treasury Department doesn't have the money? And so he and, and other bankers, um, he was dead by the time that the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 came out, but at the time and over the years from 1907 through 1913, discussed how to get together and create a Federal Reserve system, an insurance policy, a parent for the banking system so that they wouldn't have to ask the president for money or ask the Treasury Department for money or count on Congress to vote to give them money. There was just a, a place that could literally create money that they could use in the event of an emergency. And the way it was sold to the people of the United States in 1913 when the act was passed by Woodrow Wilson um, was kind of like how it's being sold now. History does repeat. And the way it was sold was 
if the Federal Reserve exists, and there's a problem on Wall Street, and money needs to go out to the farmers in the middle of the country, or the people building up the western part of the country, and it's not flowing west, which is kind of how a lot of that money was going, there's a place, and there's 12 banks within the Federal Reserve system located in San Francisco, in Dallas, in Richmond, in New York, and so forth, that'll sort of handle the problems and make sure that money goes through and it's liquid. There's a lot of water terms in finance. It goes through to wherever it needs to go, and that was how it was sold. Um, the other way it was sold in what's in the Federal Reserve Act is that it's supposed to maintain a stable financial system, be the regulator, ensure there's something called full employment, which has changed in sort of what that really means over the years and over time anyway. Um, and that inflation or the level of price increases is, is kept at a level of, of 2%. And the other thing it was supposed to do is in an emergency, and there was a clause in the Federal Reserve Act, it was the lender of last resort. In an emergency, it would be there to provide money for the system. So in 2008, there's a big emergency in that all of these banks have effectively ruined the system. They've lost a lot of money, they've committed a lot of crimes, and the entire global economy is suffering because of that. Because countries like Mexico and Greece and, and even uh, areas like Puerto Rico, regions like Puerto Rico, were all doing okay before the financial crisis. They were balancing incoming and outgoing money in terms of their own areas. Um, and when the financial crisis happened, it had a very, very quick effect everywhere. Because the U.S. banks were connected to banks everywhere. The Federal Reserve, because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world, was kind of the, the parent of parent central banks throughout the world and had to ensure that money throughout the world kept moving. Um, and so where collusion comes into play, um, and it's not about Russia, um, it's not about Mueller, but it's, it, it's, it's about the fact that the, the crisis was actually so much bigger than it even appeared at the time that it required the major other central banks in the world to work together to ensure there was enough money in an emergency for the financial system to continue to operate and for it not to close its doors, um, for, for ATMs not to stop giving money to depositors, and all the reasons that were sort of given to the world as to why it was necessary for all this money to be fabricated and given to the financial system. Um, and so the European Central Bank, which is the head central bank of, of the uh, European Union, the Bank of Japan in Japan, to a lesser extent, the Bank of England in the UK, um, and basically the G7 central, uh, central bank, banks all kind of worked on this same policy and they're all sort of like taking direction from the Federal Reserve because the other thing the Federal Reserve didn't want to have happen and U.S. major banks didn't want to have happen is for money to leave the U.S. And so when the Fed started making money available at very cheap interest rates or zero percent, which is like no percent, <laughs> um, to the banking system, which, you know, now it's a little bit higher than that, but effectively, globally, it's still 0% on average to the banking system. Um, it, was, it was partly a way to try and just fix the problems in the books of these banks that they knew were still going on. Um, and and in or if you give enough money to a problem at some point, um, it's, it's going to look like the problem is not necessarily solved, but that it, you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's like if you're at a blackjack table and you're losing hand after hand after hand in some casino and someone next to you is giving you 100 bucks for the next hand and 100 bucks for the next hand, eventually you're going to win a couple hands. Um, and if you're given enough money, you can play at enough tables that at some point you're winning somewhere. Um, and that was one of the points of what the Federal Reserve did in a policy that had never been, to the extent it currently exists, and to the extent it has grown over the years, been so much of a subsidy for these banks. So when I talk about trillions of dollars here and here, it's kind of, they're unimaginable, they're, they're big numbers. Um, but if you think about it like this, the amount of money, the trillions of dollars that have been manufactured to help the banking system in an emergency situation that has now apparently gone on for a 10-year emergency, that's a really long emergency or that's a really unhealthy financial system, um, is about $21 trillion. Now, today, now it's been more and less and stuff over the 10 years, but, it, but, but currently, um, that's what's been fabricated and is still like on offer to subsidize the financial system. Now, that is about the size of the GDP of all the goods and services of the United States. That's basically like saying there's two United States out there. There's one that's kind of here, 
and then there's one that's subsidizing the financial system. And when the Fed has these meetings, and these central bankers get together, like, like in the slides there, and all these places around the world as they do, in Davos, Switzerland, and in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and all the places they get together to discuss whatever the problem of that year happens to be and however it is they're going to solve it. The net result over the last 10 years is whatever they're talking about, there's a credit crisis in 2012 in Europe. You know, there, there's, there's problems with Greece in, in, in 2011. There's issues with um, China in 2016. Whatever it might be, they get together, and the solution to it all is we need to continue um, to the euphemism is print more money. They're not really printing money. It's, it's more sophisticated. They're electronically providing money. Um, and they're not requiring anything in exchange for it, and they're not asking for it back. So it's like you go to your ATM machine, and you think you have a balance of $100, and all of a sudden you have a balance of like a million dollars. Right? That would be nice. It would be nice if that happened. I mean, if you took, you know, trillions of dollars and you divided it out, not even necessarily per person, but, you know, it, per things that could be useful to, to growing the real economy, um, that, that's a healthy sum. And what happens in finance, what happens in banking, um, is if there's a certain amount of money available, it allows for other things to happen as sort of byproducts of just existing. And so if there's $21 trillion of money available that has gone into buying bad mortgage assets from the U.S. banks or buying certain very selected corporations uh, in uh, bonds in the European Union or stocks in Japan, all of these things are choices that these central banks make as to who to help. And then the other side of that is who they're not helping. And so the result of having all this money go into certain pockets of countries and certain pockets of financial assets is that there's a greater inequality that, that, that comes from, from just that fact. So while regular people aren't getting interest on their deposits, um, these banks are getting cheap money with which to buy their own stock. So if you look at just the big six banks in the United States because of this policy, um, they have been able to among other things, have a record quarter this past quarter. Um, they also saved an extra $3.6 billion collectively because of the tax cuts they needed so badly. Um, they have increased all of the pay for, for their CEOs substantially. Um, and they have not really raised the interest rates on people's savings accounts. In fact, a regular person who, let's say, has $1,000 of a deposit at a bank like J.P. Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Citigroup is probably paying about 20 bucks a month for the honor of keeping their money with these banks, for which they're receiving close to nothing in interest, which means they're paying 24% interest to banks to keep their money. Now, banks are paying almost nothing on interest to receive much more money than that from the Federal Reserve. So when they go and they buy their own stock, um, and that looks good for their shareholders, they have an option to not buy their own stock and to use it to basically give to their customers to increase their, you know, reduce their fees, increase their deposits, restructure some of their loans, wh whatever could be done if this was a, for a totally different system or if the Fed made them um, do what was the problem behind that question, if they made Wall Street help Main Street. And when I say Wall Street, I mean collectively banks throughout the world. It just so happens that the Wall Street banks were the sort of miscreants that the sort of the, the mouth of the financial crisis, and they continue to do what they've been doing since then, just from now a higher height and with more subsidies. And as I said before, that has ramifications throughout the world. I'm going to go very quickly, because I am um, throughout the world now, because I uh, wrote collusion out in the world. Um, I traveled to different regions, and I specifically picked those regions because they re represented um, different results of this particular policy. They were either collusive with the policy, they tried to be and couldn't, they had political problems because they tried to be and couldn't, um, and smaller countries had to deal with helping their own economies and, and, a, and a policy that worked for them internally, but then there was flack from the US and so forth. And so they, they just represent different things. Um, Mexico was the first place I went to and we spent a lot of time there. These, these were not the first times I went to any of these places. Um, but to, to, to sort of dig into this, and I had a breakfast in Monterrey, Mexico, which is the third largest, in, it's in sort of in the industrial city in Mexico, one morning after, soon after the Janet Yellen experience in Washington. And I was sitting next to a former senior member of the Central Bank of Mexico um, who had left in 2008. He actually left as the crisis was the beginning. And most countries didn't think the crisis was going to become the crisis. And I have a lot of this documentation in the book. Most of them thought this, this, this 
you know, this is a blip, this is bad, but we're going to weather this. We have nothing to do with these banks. You know, this is, this is not us. But then, of course, as the banks started hurting the economy and money started getting put into different places, it started to creep into all of these other countries that have relationships with the U.S. that had to deal with the fallout of, of a basically a recession or a depression here. Um, and so he said that at the time they were talking, they were, they were looking at sort of Washington um, and hoping that they would pick a different direction from what they did. So instead of providing money and sort of a reward um, for all the bad things banks had done, you know, sort of maybe beat them back, do something to them, regulate them, make it sort of better for the future. Um, and and uh, they actually, some of the individuals, I have a whole character um, list in the book because you, it's hard to keep track of all these people. They float around from country to country. There's a lot of names in the books. So there's a little glossary of names. Um, but, but this one person I'm, I, I thought was very uh, critical to the meaning of the giving money in the face of a crisis, Guillermo Ortiz, who was the head of the Central Bank of Mexico when the crisis hit. Um, and he went up to Washington and he said to Ben Bernanke, who was the chair of the Fed at the time, look, um, if you are going to do what I think you're going to do, then that's going to ultimately decrease confidence in the system, not increase it for the regular people, and that's going to ultimately you know, come back to haunt you. And Ben Bernanke, of course, completely ignored him did not even mention him in his memoirs. I had to actually buy the memoirs to make sure the electronic copy I had that did not mention this guy's name or any of the central bankers that warned um, that there could be ultimate problems from this particular policy in the very beginning um, were, were completely ignored. So Ortiz actually winds up not being reappointed to run the Central Bank of Mexico in the next time he's, he's up for that position because he was openly critical um, of what the U.S. was doing. He did go on the circuit. He is still involved in sort of the um, he actually is an advisor now to the Dallas Fed. So these people do sort of recycle, but he did try to warn um, as to what would happen. And the second head of the Central Bank of Mexico, Augustin Carstens, started out saying, and that's why he got the position, I, I agree with Ben Bernanke. He, he became sort of a public mouthpiece down south um, for, for, for Bernanke. And, uh, and at some point he realized this was going to be bad for Mexico. So they tried to follow the same policies as the Fed. They made money cheap. That increased inflation in Mexico because in Mexico, inflation actually was related to this policy because the central bank was closer to actual people than the central bank here is to people in our country. Um, and ultimately, he got disillusioned as well. Um, and he wound up quitting. Well, I quit once Trump was elected. But he wound up quitting um, and going to run the Bank of the International Settlements, which is, um, which is in Europe, which was created... Um, ultimately to be the central bank of central banks and that it has all the information, it looks at all the reports and for the most part for decades, it was created in 1931, it was a cheerleader of any policy any Fed would do, any ECB would do, any, any central bank would do anywhere. But even it became critical and its reports now have gone from um, being very comforting to being very critical of a policy that's basically dumped a lot of money into the market, required nothing from it, um, dumped a lot of money into the stock market, been that sort of fuel for, for very risky policies without any sort of request to restructure. Um, and now there is this shift in the world, and this is actually the positive part of the book, um, of countries like Mexico, of countries actually even like China, who've actually questioned this policy of the United States and are trying to develop alternatives where if money is being fabricated, it's at least being fabricated for real growth and real infrastructure and real development and real people and real bridges and real trains and so forth, which ours is not. Um, I spend a lot of time, probably too much time in Washington, talking to um, people of Congress on, on both sides of the aisle about financial issues. Um, and, and my, I, I don't work for a bank, obviously, anymore, so I'm, I'm really talking um, about this from the perspective of just sound policy, just, just sensible things, and it is not sensible to reward bad behavior. It's not, it's not a good economic policy, ultimately, and that's what we're really dealing with over the last 10 years. And the fact that it also creates inequality and it reduces the amount of savings people get and reduces what pension funds can be worth in the future, and then all, these, all this blame um, gets stirred up at the sort of bottom of the economy, and that's kind of going back to the video. All this, so you blame the immigrants, blame terrorists, blame workers, blame, blame those you know, lazy people in Greece who weren't working hard enough to like, uh, maintain a balanced budget there. Just, just, just outwardly shove the blame where there has been this massive trickle-down narrative policy that is not being pushed by the Republicans or the conservatives or, or whatever, any political party. It's being manufactured by central banks. They have larger checkbooks today than they've ever had before. Um, and, and they work together to basically promote that. So in Europe, um, where, where I went all over as well, uh, it was a real choice to not help 
Greece, obviously, and there was a power choice in that. But it works even worse. It looks even more foul when the European Central Bank actually has surpassed the Federal Reserve in terms of fabricating money over the last 10 years. So Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve is at four and a half trillion. European Central Bank is somewhere between five and five and a half trillion. And they choose every day where they look at the money that they're continuing to manufacture, 30 billion to 60 billion euros a month. They choose where that goes. And they choose not to put it into Greece. And they choose not to put it into small corporations in, say, Portugal or Italy. They choose to put it into Germany. They choose to put it um, in, in, in Belgium. They choose to put it where they want to. But it's not like this is money that, are, that, that has been um, earned. This is money that they make up. And, and, and the thing that just really gets me about all of this work and just all of, you know, so going all around the world, it's a very dour subject. Um, it, it's really hard to make it um, light. It's not light. Um, but what it is, is it's, it's, it's just so frustrating. It'd be one thing if there wasn't an avenue to create money when money was needed in an emergency situation. But not only is this avenue been sort of rejiggered to be so, so generous, to so, so subsidize the financial system, um, it just makes all the problems that, are, that it creates that much worse. Because that choice happens every day. It's a choice that the Federal Reserve is sitting on four and a half trillion dollars of subsidies that it provided the banking system, including one and a half trillion dollars worth of mortgages, two and a half or more trillion dollars of US treasuries. It has bought and given money to the banking system in return for buying those assets cheaply. And that debt's not getting used anywhere. The treasury bonds aren't getting used anywhere. We're supposed to borrow money to do things. That's not what's happening. It's sitting on the Fed's books. The mortgages that were still toxic 10 years ago, um, some of those assets are still sitting on the Fed's books. Um, and, and, and corporations that are failing in Europe and stock is, yeah, companies that are not doing as well in Japan, there is money for that. But there's not money for sort of the basic um, foundation of the economy. And, and that's where this is just such a crime. So some people ask um, you know, why I picked the word collusion, and I'll finish with that and open it to you for questions. But collusion, according to Google, I was actually at Google today. Um, I found out that at Google, um, they have like a, an arts and crafts sort of woodworking area. So it's like in between working, you can, you can go and like, you know, make things. <laughs> <laughs> Which I actually thought that was cool. But, um, Anyway, so, so on Google, the, the, um, if, if you look at different definitions for collusion, um, it's basically it talks about you know, a secret or elite sort of group of people that are committing fraud or criminal behavior or whatever. And one of the words is also deceit. Um, so I look at it like this is an elite group of people. Um, the people at the head of central banks, they're not elected. They're, they're generally appointed. They sort of go back and forth between the private sector um, and each other's central banks, depending on who they are and how high they are. They pop out and they get lots of money for making speeches, um, as, as one does when they come out of places like Washington and sort of, you know, sort of richer uh, cities throughout the world. Um, and, the, and they manufacture money. Um, and then in all of the narratives about the manufacturing that money, they talk about how it's helped with growth. And it hasn't really helped with growth by definition because it is sitting on their books. It's, it's not even like logical. Um, to assume it has trickled down somewhere into growth. Yes, stock markets are higher, but if there's an availability of money to one group of, of, of institutions to use to buy their own stock, and banks actually have to ask the Fed if it's okay to buy their own stock, and the Fed has to say either yes or no, and it always says yes, well, then they buy their own stock, and it goes up. So that, that's not an indicator of health. That's just, that's just an indicator of money. Um, and and, and so, so, so I find that that's kind of the, the biggest deceit in all of this, and, and the, the deceit is that this policy, this 10 years of emergency policy has somehow funneled in to the major economy. And I'll finish on that with, I was on CNBC on Friday, and I don't know if you, have, and you saw this, it's, um, it was cut short because Trump was talking about something in the beginning of the segment, and um, so it was a short segment, um, and it was me and some hedge fund guy, and um, we were talking about wages. And the topic was, not unlike Wall Street not helping Main Street, but it was sort of like, why aren't wages going up um, as much if the stock market is up so high? Like, what's going on? What's the deal with that? Um, and wages had increased by 0.1% last month. That would be like nothing, right? This, now, the, 
The top six banks put in record quarters over that period of time. They, they bought lots of their own stock. Their stock went, lots of other things happened. Um, so, so we're talking about this, and, and I'm explaining that this, this money didn't go into wages. It's gone into stocks. And the guy on the other side is saying, yeah, but Apple just announced an $100 billion stock buyback, and they announced higher bonuses. And I'm like, well, bonuses and wages are just so not the same thing. Um, bonuses are like this portion of stock goes into your pocket, and wages are like the thing you actually have to count on to live on, and it hasn't moved. Um, but the thing was, he got the last argument. So the way it worked on the media was he said something first. He was asked a question first about this. I responded something like what I just told you. And then he basically said, no, you're wrong. And that's how the segment was cut, right? And I don't do that. You know, I'm sitting there. You know, I wasn't. You know, you're in a chair. You're looking at a camera. You know, you you have no control over or any of that. And then when the segment was actually put out on Google, online, it it said something like our wage is going up, and that was the title of the segment. So 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 also there's a lot of other factors in terms of continuing to spin this narrative that don't sort of bear out. Um, in the real data. So, so ultimately, um, what my book is about is looking at how this collusion of fabricating money has impacted um, countries throughout the world, who's been doing what when. Um, every single chapter in every geography kind of starts with the crisis in 2008 and goes through to, to today, or basically when I handed in the book, so sort of like recently, um, and then goes back. So you're constantly looking at that this 10-year period from a different perspective around the world. And so hopefully that provides, um, if, you, if you read the book, a, a, um, just, just, just a composite of what's, what's happening. Because we are actually all in this together. Um, the Fed has sort of been the dominant parent um, in terms of providing financing to the system. But ultimately, um, th this is a world in which there are many ramifications everywhere, and we are in that um, together. And so that's really how I positioned it. In terms of solutions, which I end with um, to this, there's, there's lots of things that could be done, um, just in terms of financial policy in the United States. And, and, and those of you who know my work, I, I am a big advocate of, of Glass-Steagall reenactment, of, of separating the deposits and the loans from everything else that banks do, including now buying their own stock with lots and lots of money from the Fed. Um, and, and having at least some sort of stability at that level of the system, reducing their size, how many uh, deposits and assets they can have as a percentage of what's available um, in our country and in countries throughout the world. Um, if we do this here and we do it in other places, um, to have central banks, um, if, they, if they exist, to do their actual job, which is regulating uh, financial institutions, not sort of rewarding them for bad behavior, and certainly not having unlimited um, unaudited check writing capabilities that they have right now. Um, having the people who run these banks actually elected rather than appointed so that they're accountable to the public because their policies affect the public. Um, and actually canceling a lot of the debt that's been created in the wake of the financial crisis throughout the world um, that has been created in, in countries um, and by smaller companies that have required, uh, that are required to do that to basically borrow because they're not really recipients of the sort of big money that's coming from the top and, and sort of creating a more stable environment from that perspective and taking some of the money that's on offer and ensuring that it goes into development and infrastructure and wages and reduction of student loans and everything else that it could go for, which could actually do what all of these central banks have promised their policies will do, which is really promote real growth on real sort of Main Street and the equivalent of Main Street throughout the world. So I'm going to open it to questions from you guys um, on that. Thank you for listening. Um.